um, Professor Chijun Su and dear participants, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, and Happy New Year 2021. Uh, welcome to another nice webinar on China's foreign policy under Xi Jinping, continuities and changes. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world freedom from conflict. We envision a world where source of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is advocated. China study is one of our major research center. China studies as a whole brings into perspective the rising powers mounting economic, military, and diplomatic cloud that certainly has the aptitude to either overturn or sustain the current contemporary world order. The center broadly examines China's international strategic thinking and conduct foreign policy and security policy, and the impact of domestic politics and economy on China's foreign relations. It further addresses China's emergence in the face of the world in flux, domestic politics, economy, society, culture, people liberation army, and Tibet autonomous region, and most importantly, her engagement with each of South Asian countries. To talk on this very interesting topic of today, we have Professor Chi Chung Su. Uh, Professor Chu is Professor of Political Science and International Relations and Chair of Department of International Relations at Bucknell University, United States. He was Bucknell's inaugural director of the China Institute from 2013 to 2017 and Mark Arthur Chair in East Asian Politics in 2008 to 2014. He previously taught at University of Bridgeport, Hamilton College, University of South Carolina and Shanghai International Studies University. In the early 1990s, he was senior assistant to Council for Press and Cultural Affairs at the American Council General in Shanghai. A noted scholar in Chinese foreign policy, Dr. Chu is a member of the National Committee on United States-China Relations and is frequently quoted by international media on Chinese and East Asian affairs. Professor Chu's teaching and research interests include international relations theories, Chinese politics and foreign policy, East Asian pol political economy, and US-Asian relations. He is the author and editor of a dozen books, including A Critical Debate, China's Foreign Policy from 2008 to 2018, which was published by World Scientific in 2019. China's New Diplomacy, Rational Strategies and Significance, published by Asgate in 2013, New Dimension in East Asian Politics, Security, Political Economy and Society, published by Bloomsbury in 2012, The People's Republic of China, Internal and External Challenges, published by World Scientific in 2010, and US-China Relations in the 21st century, century, Power, Transition, and Peace, published by Rutledge in 2005. Professor Chu has received many research fellowships and grants, such as two POSCO fellowships at the East-West Center in Hawaii, a Korean Foundation Freeman Foundation grant to do research in Korea, three senior visiting fellowship at the East Asian Institute of National University of Singapore, visiting professor at Doshisa University in Japan, Kyungpok National University in Korea, and Shanghai University, Fudan University, and Chachang University in China, as well as a research grant from American Political Science Association. Dr. Chu, you will have around 30 to 35 minutes to make your initial remark, which will be followed by question and answers. We'd like to request all our participants to drop their question in the Zoom chat room or under the Facebook Live. Uh, Dr. Chu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and your invitation. Uh, it is a really great honor, great pleasure to be with you today. Um, I've never been to uh, Nepal, so uh, I'm very excited about this uh, virtual visit. And I look forward to the days when travel is possible and so that I can go there actually meet you guys in person. Um, I always enjoy exchanging views with scholars and students from different parts of the world. I know that today we have uh, scholars and students from uh, Nepal, India, and other countries uh, in South Asia. I want to thank you for spending uh, this evening with me. And if there are people from outside South Asia, I also want to thank you for spending your morning or afternoon with me. Uh, now, speaking of uh, China's foreign policy under Xi Jinping, I think uh, probably many of you will use adjectives such as uh, ambitious, uh, assertive, and aggressive, right? Those triple A, you know. Uh, what I'm going to do today is to um, 
offer some historical and contemporary context, try to understand where China's foreign policy has changed and where it remains the same. So, uh, so as the host said, and I, I'm going to speak for about 30, 35 minutes or so, and, um, and I will leave uh, plenty of time for Q&A, and I, I look forward to the discussions. I uh, did prepare some slides, so let me see if I can share the slides with you. As I said, you know, we want to look at the China's foreign policy from a historical perspective. Th this is a book I like a lot. I teach uh, courses like Chinese politics. I always assign uh, this book for my students, you know. I'm not sure how many of you have read this. It was written by uh, two uh, great fine scholars on China and Asia. Century long pursuit for wealth and power by generations of Chinese uh, intellectuals and, and scholars and national leaders. So uh, it, it's very clear that Xi Jinping is not the first uh, Chinese leader to try to turn China into a, a wealthy and powerful nation. I strongly recommend uh, this book to you. you know. Of course, you know, we're not going to uh, go back to a long history. You know. We're going to focus on uh, post-1949, post Deng Xiaoping, uh, uh, era and we'll focus on what is happening now, right? Okay, so here's a, a quick uh, survey of uh, what it, what has happened uh, in the PRC. We don't have time to go into details, but uh, some key terms here, some key uh, issues I think we have to understand, uh, which may help us uh, to uh, figure out you know, why uh, what is happening, why it is happening today, right? And this uh, 1949 starting date, the founding of the PRC, uh, of course, the PRC's narratives that the CCP, the Communist Party of China, led the Chinese people uh, to officially end the so-called century of humiliation. Now, this is a very powerful narrative. This still shapes uh, China's domestic and foreign policy. So you have to remember this narrative of, about century of humiliation. Now, you notice that uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, 1970s, in each of those uh, decades, at least one major war broke out involving China, right? In the 50s, it was the Korean War, uh, 60s, Sino-Indian War, uh, which still casts a long shadow on, uh, on China-India relations today. And there was also a small scale border clash between China and Soviet Union. Now, 70s uh, was the uh, China-Vietnam War before uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, officially uh, opened China up to the West. Then if you move quickly forward, you notice that after the uh, 1979 war, China actually has not engaged in any major wars since then. I mean, you can, you can argue that, well, uh, how about the, the border clashes uh, in India and other places, right? Yeah, but those are not really major wars. We're talking about major wars, right? So in other words, you know, China has been able to enjoy a peaceful environment since the end of 1979, since the 1970s, right? uh, which is very important for us to understand why China was able to develop so quickly you know, without this uh, peaceful environment economic growth obviously is impossible. So moving forward, you realize that China's focus has changed, right? Previously, you know, China was busy with, you know, with wars, with, with these ideological issues. But since 1980s, China has focused on economic development, aiming to catch up with the West. And eventually, of course, in 2010, China surpassed Japan to become the second largest economy. And of course, before that, you know, Chinese economy leapfrogged, right, to surpass Britain, Italy, you know, Germany, one by one in the 1990s, uh, 2000s. So here comes uh, Xi Jinping, 20, uh, 2012, he became the uh, uh, party secretary, right? 2013, uh, he was uh, named the president of the PRC. So with this uh, solid, foundation, strong economic basis, 
not just Xi, I mean, anybody in that position probably can do a lot of things in terms of China's foreign policy, right? I think this historical context is important for us to understand, you know, why it's happening now. Right? Um, as I said, you know, I like to provide a, a, a context. Now, if you look at the, uh, the policies today and compare the policies with, the, uh, with what China did during the Cold War, and you see very vast differences here, right? During the Cold War, we noticed that, that China was opposing a lot of things. The China was not happy, right? China was opposing American imperialism, was opposing Soviet revisionism, and was opposing American hegemony, opposing Japanese militarism, and of course, opposing Taiwanese independence. Now, of course, you know, I think China still opposes a lot of things, a lot of things today, right? Revival of Japanese militarism, for example, definitely uh, uh, Taiwanese independence, so China continues to oppose those kind of things, but increasingly, uh, after 2000, you see a more confident, more outgoing China, right? Uh, the Chinese government emphasizes peaceful development. It's 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 happier now, <laughs> unlike uh, during the Cold War, right? Uh, China has uh, invited foreign investment in Jinglai, right? But also, it has started to go out in terms of or investment, trade, right? And international affairs, China emphasizes the importance of international cooperation, the win-win, right? And, and of course, China realizes that its international image, its soft power is not so good, especially in the West, right? So China is also trying to boost its international image by uh, developing soft power. And China's diplomacy has become more active, more multi-directional, multi-layered, right? And increasingly, China is also talking about uh, assuming more international or global responsibilities, not just uh, as a developing country uh, that continues to benefit from international system. It is also talking about how China can contribute to global growth. These are uh, real changes uh, in evolutions, if you like, right? So, so China's foreign policy has really uh, transformed over the past few uh, decades. Now, and of course, uh, the PRC has uh, had five generations of uh, uh, leadership, right? Uh, Mao, Deng, Jiang Zemin, Xi Jinping, and Xi Jinping, right? But these three, Mao, Deng, Xi, are perhaps uh, the most uh, significant uh, leaders for the PRC. Now, this is a, a very popular view inside China. Maybe simplistic, but I think you know it tells something about uh, what the three generations of Chinese leaders have done for China, right? Mao, Mao Zedong, you know, uh, you remember in uh, on October the first, nineteen forty nine, he was standing on the uh, Tiananmen Rostrum, Tiananmen Square, proudly claiming that the Chinese people have stood up, ending the century of humiliation, right? So the Chinese people have stood up. Uh, foreign forces were all expelled out of China. So Mao helped China to stand up as an independent uh, state. And of course, Mao launched all those political campaigns, including uh, the Great Leap Forward, Cultural Revolution, right? So which uh, plunged China into uh, chaos and the Chinese economy almost collapsed. Uh, and, and China was weak poor, right? Now, after Mao died, 1976, uh, shortly afterwards, uh, Deng Xiaoping was uh, brought back to uh, Beijing and he was uh, sent to the uh, uh, south, the countryside during the Cultural Revolution, right? He was brought back. Uh, he immediately became the supreme leader uh, and introduced all those economic and limited political reforms. And one of his uh, slogans I think some of you may know this, right? One of the slogan was, you know, to get rich is glorious. So the whole nation was uh, incentivized to work hard, to make money, get rich. So that's why many Chinese believe that uh, Deng Xiaoping helped China to become uh, rich. Uh, right? Now, it's uh, Xi Jinping's turn. What is Xi Jinping going to do? The China is standing up, China is rich now, and Remember the, the book I just mentioned earlier, you know, 
not just the rich you know, and wealthy, but also powerful, a powerful state in the international system. So uh, it has become imperative for Xi Jinping to realize this century long dream of the Chinese. So Xi Jinping, what Xi Jinping is doing is trying to help China to become a powerful state, a great state that is uh, recognized, respected by the international system. So you see some uh, uh, historical continuity here, right? And uh, so if you look at this uh, from a historical perspective, nothing is uh, uh, extraordinary, Not, nothing is uh, uh, strange about what is happening in China. These are some photos of Deng Xiaoping, right? The probably you the photo on the uh, on the right shows Deng Xiaoping uh, wearing a cowboy hat when he was visiting the United States in uh, 1929. He was visiting the rodeo, a rodeo in Texas, which uh, is very significant. You know, the Deng Xiaoping uh, among uh, Chinese leaders was. Uh, probably more pro-West, uh, pro-capitalism, uh, uh, right? And he loved uh, things uh, uh, Western. You know? so this is a page I want to show, you know. So Deng Xiaoping still, uh, Deng Xiaoping's influence can still be felt today in China's domestic politics. So what, what is Deng Xiaoping's legacy? I think uh, we have to uh, take a look here, you know. I think very different from Mao, you know. Deng Xiaoping decided that we should talk less about ideology. We should focus on economic development and modernization of China. So he he was a very pragmatic leader, you know. And you are familiar with his uh, cat theory, right? The cat, you know, the, it doesn't matter you know, what what the, the color the cat is, right? Black black or white. If it can catch mice, it's good cat. So what does that mean? No, he was talking about the socialism, capitalism, right? Let's forget about this ideological debate. Whichever system can deliver, can bring uh, economic growth for China, we'll adopt that system. So basically he was saying that, that we should embrace capitalism, right? And, and, and of course he, has, uh, he, he never abandoned uh, communism as a communist uh, leader, right? But he, in his policy, he did embrace capitalist policies. And uh, it, uh, it's very clear that he wanted to learn from the West. Uh, you know, he studied in the West. He studied in France as a teenager, right? So he had first-hand experience uh, living, working in the West. He knew you know, what the Western world is like. So he, he believed that China needed to catch up, to learn from the West. And uh, after 1978, after he introduced those political economic reforms. Now, two of the first countries he visited were Japan and the United States. Uh, I just showed you one of the photos he was uh, he uh, he took in in the United States. Right in the United States, he also visited Atlanta, uh, Houston, and uh, and uh, Seattle. Now you may wonder why he went to those places. Right, uh, it was purposeful because he wanted to learn from the United States. He wanted to attract Western American businesses to China because Atlanta was, uh, is, the, is the headquarters of Coca-Cola company, right? And Houston is where uh, NASA is located. And Seattle is where the Boeing company is located. So he visited those cities uh, very clearly to try to invite uh, these American businesses to come to China, to invest in China. Uh, near home, uh, Deng Xiaoping also tried to maintain good neighbor policy. Uh, he normalized relations with, with all neighbors. I think, you know, Singapore uh, probably is the last country that uh, established diplomatic relations with China in 1990. Um, and uh, in international affairs, Deng Xiaoping argued that the uh, uh, China was you know, still weak and China's focus should be on domestic issues. So we should keep a low profile, the so-called Tao Guangyang Hui, right? Now, Tao Guangyang Hui, I think, is translated uh, incorrectly in the West. Uh, many uh, Westerners, people outside China, 
translated as something like uh, to, to hide your brightness, uh, to bide your time, which is totally wrong. I think that's a wrong interpretation. Because if you translate, translate it that way, it seems like China is, is revengeful. China is going to revenge <laughs> when it's going to be powerful, right? Uh, but I think the, the basic meaning of Tao Gong Yang Hui is, is that uh, China needs to be humble. China needs to uh, focus on domestic growth. China needs to keep a low profile on international affairs. That's the basic meaning of, of uh, Tao Gong Yang Hui, right? So you see more continuities. The objective to turn China into a wealthy and powerful nation. That has never changed. And China continues to conduct multilateral and multidirectional diplomacy. Almost ironic. The United States used to be the leader in, in promoting multilateralism. But under Trump, of course, the United States has withdrawn from a multilateral cooperation under the slogan, make America great again, right? So China apparently has become a champion in promoting multilateral cooperation and Chinese diplomacy reaches every corner of the world. Uh, and China also uh, practices summit diplomacy, meaning top leaders travel frequently overseas, you know, now, especially before the pandemic, of course, right? Uh, even during the pandemic, uh, Chinese leaders have conducted uh, telephone diplomacy, you know, talking to their counterparts overseas. Uh, other types of diplomacy, you know, cultural, uh, sports, right? Panda diplomacy, right? Uh, and more recently, of course, uh, vaccine diplomacy. I think uh, China has uh, promised that uh, after it has developed vaccines, uh, it's going to make them available to developing countries. Uh, all these are part of uh, a so-called active uh, diplomacy that uh, Xi Jinping has inherited, actually, and not uh, developed. Um, consolidating relations with Africa, Asia, and other parts of the developing world uh, remains a top priority of uh, China's foreign policy today. And if you, uh, if you follow China's uh, uh, Diplomacy by uh, you know by a uh, foreign Chinese foreign minister, you realize that since two thousand actually, uh, the Chinese foreign minister will always start his new year, new year diplomacy by visiting countries in Africa. So just like here yeah, this year, you know, uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi just came back from uh, Africa, right? He visited uh, several countries over there, and that has become a tradition. Or Chinese foreign minister to go to Africa first in a new year, followed by Asia. I think Wang Yi came back from Africa. Then, after a couple of days, he went to Southeast Asia. Right? So, consolidating relations with Asian, African, and other developing countries remains a priority for Chinese diplomacy. And of course, China has tried to expand the trade investment globally. That has also uh, been the case. Uh, in, in the past few decades. So that's part of the continuing efforts by the Chinese foreign policy establishment, right? Defending China's core interests, obviously, uh, is, a, uh, is something that uh, Xi Jinping and other leaders have continued to do, right? So the question is, what are those core interests? You know? um, it, it, it's, um, well, it's based on this white paper. I mean, it's, it's very clear, right? Those uh, five or six areas uh, are core interests, you know? But in, if you translate them into real policies, what does that really mean by core interests, right? Uh, for example, state sovereignty. Um, now you realize that the, uh, the Chinese government has a lot of differences with uh, other countries, with the United States, for example, right? Over issues on Taiwan and, and Hong Kong, right? Now, it's very interesting to, to observe the differences here, right? People outside China probably will look at Hong Kong, you know, Taiwan, very differently, right? They think that this is an issue of democracy, right? Uh, well, in the Chinese uh, official perspective, 
nonsense, you know. These are not issues of security or democracy. These are state sovereignty, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so issues like uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan become sovereignty issues. And these are core interests. On issues of uh, core interests, the Chinese government is uh, unwilling to compromise. So in other words, you know, you cannot negotiate with China about uh, the status of Hong Kong or uh, whether Taiwan can become independent. Now, these are not negotiable because these are core interests of China, right? National security, territorial in integrity. Uh, because uh, the Chinese government believes that uh, uh, Taiwan, you know, South China Sea, you know, those are part of uh, China's territory, you know, it's non-negotiable. Now, of course, you know, countries outside, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, China's neighbors and, and in the West probably disagree, right? Uh, I'm not trying to uh, uh, take a stand here or, or necessarily endorse the, the Chinese government's position, right? But I think, you know, we, we have to understand why there are such a sharp difference over those controversial issues, right? And the, uh, these core interests tell us, you know, why uh, so some of those issues are, issues are so difficult, uh, almost impossible to uh, to reconcile. Uh, national unification again, uh, it, it's just impossible for Taiwan to become independent, you know, based on China's core interests, right? Because the China has always considered Taiwan to be part of China. Um, political system. You now, if you advocate overthrowing the Chinese uh, system, communist system, that's not going to work, right? And you're not going anywhere. Uh, so uh, this list of core interests, I think, uh, are important for us to understand uh, why China is doing certain things why China has adopted certain policies, right? And these are also part of the continuities. These have not changed over the years, right? Now, there are some changes, of course, uh, when we talk about. I, I will highlight two major areas. I think the first area is setting specific uh, Global leadership role is global ambitions, right? As I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, generations of Chinese leaders and the scholars and the, uh, have 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 this Chinese dream, right, to turn China into a wealthy and powerful nation. Uh, Xi Jinping is uh, no exception, you know, right? Uh, he proposed this concept called Chinese dream, but that Chinese dream is not new; it's not <laughs> unique to Xi Jinping, right? I think generations of Chinese leaders have talked about this dream or dream this, this dream, right? But they couldn't do it. I think only now uh, it has become a real possibility, right? So this national rejuvenation uh, has become a real possibility uh, today as Xi Jinping continues to uh, push China forward. Now, this timetable, uh, I think it's important for us to remember these two centennial goals. Uh, you know, previous leaders have also talked about, you know, how China should become a modern state, but they don't, the, the, they don't, they didn't set up this uh, specific timetable, right? But Xi Jinping set this specific timetable. First centennial goal uh, uh, coming up very soon, right? Next year, actually now, this year, right? 2021, we're already in 2021 now. Uh, it marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the CCP. Um, the official target, official objective is to turn China into a moderately prosperous state. And I think at the end of last year, the Chinese government officially declared that uh, uh, the, the government has eliminated the poverty, which is uh, uh, questionable, right? I think, you know, if you uh, uh, go to China, you know, probably you will still find people living in, uh, in poverty. But, but the fact is, of course, uh, over 800 million people have been lifted out of poverty in the past four, three decades. Uh, so this, I think you know, uh, this first centennial goal of eliminating poverty 
to turn China into a, a moderately prosperous state. It can be realized, really, right? I think you still have one year to go, and, and you can still fix uh, uh, some uh, loose uh, holes here and there. And so this centennial goal, I think, can be realized. Now, more, more importantly, next centennial goal, 2049, that's the 100th anniversary of the founding of the PRC. Now, what's the objective? The objective is to turn China into a modern socialist state that is uh, prosperous, that's, that is really strong, powerful, that is democratic, that is uh, harmonious, and that is uh, civilized. A lot of adjectives, right? Uh, so the objective is to turn China into a really powerful, modern, major global power. And, 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 and for that, I think, uh, I mean, uh, Xi Jinping has, has, has done a lot you know, to push China towards that objective. Now, will China be able to achieve uh, that goal? Well, it's hard to predict the future, right? But looks like China is on a good track to uh, becoming a powerful, prosperous, modern state by the mid-century, right? But once again, you know, Xi Jinping was the, perhaps the first only leader who set the specific uh, target dates, timetable for China to become a, a modern, wealthy and powerful state to finally realize the Chinese dream. Now, in addition to setting up the uh, timetable, Xi Jinping has also uh, demonstrated his global ambitions to turn China into a global leader in many issues, many affairs, right? Uh, for example, just highlight a few here, right? He, uh, he launched a few uh, new, new initiatives uh, we all know the uh, AIIB, uh, which actually just celebrated uh, five years. Uh, uh, yes, recently, you know, it was uh, officially launched in 2015 and uh, became operation in 2016. So yes, they are celebrating a fifth uh, uh, year anniversary. Um, and of course, uh, uh, now there are over 100 members in this uh, bank. Initially, uh, 57 founding members, including uh, major developing economies, China and India, right? United States and, and uh, Japan probably are the only major economies that are not uh, members of the AIB yet, but they have not excluded uh, future uh, opportunities to join them. Belt and Road Initiative, massive project and also becoming more controversial in the West, right? That's also a new initiative by President Xi uh, in 2013, right? Um, in dealing with uh, uh, great powers, especially the United States, President Xi also proposed this new concept called new type of great power relations. Now, if you study history, if you follow uh, Harvard professor, uh, Graham Allison, you know, uh, so-called Thucydides trap, you know, this great power competition ending in war. Uh, the picture is scary, right? Uh, because uh, the, the powers always compete and fight with each other. And typically they ended in war, in history, right? And what Xi Jinping is saying is that, look, you know, it's 21st century now. We don't have to repeat history. We can establish a new type of great power relations. We can you know, we should respect each other's core interests, right? And we can cooperate in many areas and we can shelve our differences, of course. So this, uh, this is a new proposal to manage the power transition between the United States and China. Um, unfortunately, uh, this new proposal has not been <laughs> well received <laughs> by the United States. And, and you see the confrontation, uh, rising tensions uh, between the two countries recently, you know. Uh, another proposal by Xi Jinping is this concept called uh, community with shared future for mankind. Again, he's uh, talking about international cooperation, right? Win-win for uh, all countries involved. Uh, BRI actually is an uh, uh, example of this new concept called community with shared future for uh, mankind. Right? In 2017, now uh, his uh, indication of his global ambition. 2017 at the National Security Council, uh, 
conference, uh, President Xi proposed these two guides, uh, Liang Yingdao, two guides. According to him, you know, China should guide the international community to jointly build a more just and reasonable new world order. And China should guide the international community to jointly maintain international security. Now, if you look, if you look at the, the objectives here, fine, totally fine, right? Because we do need a, a more just and a reasonable global order. We do need to maintain international security, right? Now, what is interesting here is that apparently uh, President Xi wants China to play the leadership role, to guide, to lead the international community to obtain those objectives. Now, this is becoming controversial, right? Because on other occasions, Chinese, Chinese leaders have also said that uh, we don't want to be uh, uh, another United States. We don't want to replace the United States to, to become the global leader. We don't have those hegemonic ambitions. So how do you <laughs> reconcile the, the difference here? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit con contradictory here, right? And I leave that to, uh, to our audience to uh, figure out, you know, how, how do we uh, uh, reconcile the two different uh, directions China se seems to be uh, taking, right? Um, other new policy, new initiatives uh, by President Xi is, you know, this uh, efforts to tell the China story. Now, this is, uh, according to the official uh, interpretation, you know, this is because the outside world, especially the Western world, Western media have long you know, misinterpreted China. And this Western report of China has always been biased. So this uh, tell this China story narrative is pro uh, promoted by the uh, Chinese government as a way to counter Western bias towards China, right? And more recently, of course, you know, uh, people talk about uh, China's uh, war for diplomacy. Apparently, a group of Chinese diplomats, especially uh, 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 spokespersons uh, in the Chinese foreign ministry, have become more uh, forceful and confrontational in you know, criticizing other countries, foreign leaders and in presenting Chinese positions, right? People call them uh, wolf warriors, right? And, uh, and if, or if we have time later, we can have more discussions on this. Right? So this wolf warrior has also become part of the tell the China story uh, narrative, right? Another uh, difference I think I want to highlight is the first lady's role, you know? First lady, this is a Western, uh, really a Western uh, concept, right? Because um, in traditional Asian societies, you know, ladies, Especially tradition, even today, right? Ladies, uh, I mean, we, we do have lady uh, women leaders uh, in many places, right? Uh, but uh, women typically take a, a low profile role in politics. So even first ladies, you know, in, in Chinese politics, used to be very uh, low profile. Uh, this has changed under Xi Jinping, you know, uh, because why? Because Xi Jinping uh, has a what should I say, you know, has a glamorous. Uh, popular uh, wife, you know, his wife actually was more famous uh, than him himself in the 1980s, 1990s. Now, I can show you a picture here, right? Uh, Peng Li Yuan um, is a famous uh, folk singer uh, in China. Uh, she became famous a long time ago, right? Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, and this the since 1980s, you know, 1990s, you know, uh, when Xi Jinping was uh, still a low level county official. Uh, and uh, now, Peng Li Yuan would accompany Xi Jinping to travel around the world to become a, a real, a, a, you know, a real first lady and playing a first lady role. Uh, she all, she's also being uh, involved in, you know, in her own kind of diplomacy, right? I think. Now she still holds this uh, title, no, not real job, right? I think she's the goodwill ambassador for the uh, World Health Organization, right? Uh, working to promote global health. Uh, 
Now, this, this is unprecedented because all uh, previous leaders of China uh, either never traveled with their spouses or, uh, you know, or their wives only played very minimal uh, role in public life, right? But uh, uh, she introduced uh, uh, these new changes. I don't know whether this will be sustained uh, after she, but it looks like uh, you know it's uh, uh, it's well received uh, both at home and abroad. So th this is another uh, uh, change. So I know we're, we're probably running out of time. You know, looking looking ahead, you know, what are the uh, major challenges? Well, the list is not. Uh, um, These are some of the major challenges I think China is facing. For example, uh, managing relations with, with other great powers, especially uh, the United States, Japan, the EU, Russia, India, right? Uh, even though uh, China doesn't want really to be dragged into uh, this great power competition, right? As I've mentioned, you know, China really wants to focus on developing countries, its neighborhood, right? But as a big power, you have no choice. You know? Uh, I think uh, another challenge here, you know, is how to maintain peaceful, friendly relation with neighbors. Although it's it's a priority, you notice that uh, China's relations with uh, several neighbors are not going well now, right? Especially uh, Japan, India, uh, and far or well, not too far away, Australia. If you can consider Australia as a neighbor, right? Uh, and even the Chinese have a saying: a close neighbor is dearer than a distant relative. So obviously, uh, China needs to work harder to uh, maintain strong, friendly relations with its neighbors. I think another challenge is, is the balance between soft power and uh, hard power. We all know that China's hard power is, is becoming stronger and stronger, right? There's no doubt about it. But uh, its soft power apparently is not commensurate with uh, its hard power doesn't match, right? especially in the West and in, uh, also in certain uh, parts of the developing world, for example, in India also, right? Uh, but uh, in many other parts of the developing world, actually China does enjoy pretty good, pretty uh, benign international image. Uh, I think China also needs to balance its national interests and global responsibilities. But China has been accused of being a, a free rider, right? Just being a, a beneficiary of the international system, not doing enough to contribute to the international system. I think gradually, actually, China is making more contributions to the international system to become a more global uh, power, to take more global responsibilities. For example, now, uh, you, know, you, you know that China has become the second largest contributor to the UN budget, right? Uh, just behind the United States. Uh, another challenge is to you know, balance uh, this national security and human security. You know, national security is an old uh, concept, right? They talk about na nation state, right? What the nation uh, should do, uh, this territorial integrity, right? Uh, sovereignty, you know, those are old you know, concepts. I think increasingly, especially the pandemic <laughs> has taught us a lesson, right? Uh, this human security has become more important. It's the, it's the it's human, human, uh, human life, human dignity, right? Uh, human growth will become new challenges, not just for China, you know, really for many countries, especially developing countries. So that balance uh, needs to be maintained uh, by China. Uh, non, yes, non-traditional challenges, uh, economic change, right? Public health, yes. Uh, and I have to add that, uh, you know, foreign policy of China, is not just determined by what's happening inside China or just determined by who the leader China is, right? I think you also need to look at external factors that also help shape China's foreign policy. And in this sense, we all know that uh, the United States is the biggest external factor that uh, somehow influences China's foreign policy. I think you, know, you can argue easily, you know, in the past four years, for example, China's foreign policy has become more aggressive, assertive, which is 
easy to understand. Why? Because the United States has taken a confrontation approach to China. And to a large extent, China is just reacting to America's confrontation approach by Trump and Pompeo, right? So I'm not saying that the United States is the only factor, right? But obviously, you know, it's a big external factor that uh, heavily influences uh, China's foreign policy. Um, finally, just takeaway points. If, if I can summarize <laughs> what I've covered so far, I think you know a, a, a cursive uh, survey of history tells us that uh, history matters. If you want to understand uh, any country's foreign policy, right? In China's case, this century of humiliation uh, definitely is a major concept that continues to shape China's domestic foreign policy, right? Power matters. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, before uh, 1990, you know, China was busy you know, opposing the United States, Soviet Union, right, Japan, you know, because China was, was, was poor. China didn't have any power to do much internationally. But after 1990, you know, China has become more and more powerful, which provides this basis you know, for China to play a more active role in international affairs. So, so today, as China has become the second largest economy, and perhaps soon to be the top economy, obviously China will become more active, and its foreign policy will become more, you know, multi-directional. And in, in the view of some people, it will become more aggressive. I mean, that's just natural, if you like, right? Leadership matters. Yes, leadership will make a difference, and I don't think we need to tell, you know, spend too much time talking about this, right? Uh, Xi Jinping and Trump, you know, for example, right? these are national leaders, these are individual leaders. Leaders can make a big difference. International environment also matters, right? Not just relations with the United States, but also uh, uh, policies from, uh, from uh, other countries, Japan, India, Russia, Australia, you know, obviously will have some influence on China's policy, right? Uh, and finally, of course, foreign policy in, in any country, just, just not, not just in China, right? is an extension of um, uh, domestic politics. Foreign policy uh, serves uh, the national interests, serve the domestic objectives, right? Um, just do some shameless uh, uh, self-promotion here. You know, this, this is a book, I, uh, my latest book, published about a year ago, which uh, actually uh, uh, documents some of the uh, continuities and changes in China's uh, foreign policy. And eight, of course, uh, is a turning point, I believe. You know, in, in that year, two things happened, right? Uh, one is the uh, Western global financial crisis uh, started in the United States, quickly spread to other parts of the world. And some people would argue that uh, 2008 perhaps marks the beginning of this long-term US decline. Same year, 2008, Beijing successfully hosted Summer Olympics. Some commentators argue that that's the beginning of China's long-term revival or re-emergence. And well, there's some truth to it, right? So uh, whether you believe it or not, you know, 2008 apparently is an important um, year. And uh, that's why I uh, titled my, my book, uh, Critical Decade. I think, you know, obviously a lot of things happened during that decade and it's a good uh, period to study China's foreign policy in terms of um, continuities and changes. I will stop here and I'll be happy to uh, uh, you know, discuss uh, with you and answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chi Chun Chu. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. It was really comprehensive and enlightening. We learned a lot. I'm sure our participants also immensely benefited from it. We would like to thank you for your time and we have received lots of questions. So let's move to the question and answer session. Uh, the first question is how is US-China relation going to unfold during Biden administration? <laughs> well, I mean, it's too early to, uh, to tell. I mean, yeah, I, I don't have the crystal ball. I cannot predict uh, what, what will happen. It's not uh, officially inaugurated yet. You know, it's going to happen in two, three days, right? 
Uh, well, many people uh, assume that uh, his approach will be a little bit different from uh, Trump. And, uh, and he, 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 Trump, even during Trump administration, you know, it's very interesting, you know, during the first half, you know, um, I think the relationship was okay, right? And Trump and she met several times and Trump called she, you know, his friend. Uh, it was during the second half, I think, uh, especially after pandemic, I think the relationship turned really uh, terrible. Uh, and and um, uh, Trump's foreign policy team, especially uh, Pompeo, uh, these people are obviously very hostile to China. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the um, President Biden's uh, Asia team or China team, you realize that uh, uh, the, uh, these officials probably are more balanced. Uh, they are not necessarily friendly towards China, right? But I think they are uh, probably going to be more moderate. And they're going to be focusing on both uh, the areas that uh, they can cooperate uh, and areas they disagree, right? Unlike uh, Trump you know, and, and Pompeo, they only focus on areas of great differences, uh, only focus on confrontation. I think the Biden team is uh, more likely to, to treat China as is. You know? China is a rising power. And yes, it has a lot of issues, a lot of problems, but China has also contributed a lot to international development. And that's just a fact, you cannot deny it. And China is a critical partner in many of the initiatives that the Biden is interested. For example, climate change. Uh, I think uh, President Biden will seek China's cooperation. And China is willing, definitely willing to cooperate, right? I think President Xi announced earlier, uh, in, uh, last year, right? Uh, China wants to become a carbon neutral by 2060. Uh, first country, first developing country to make that solemn pledge. In this area, United States and China definitely can cooperate. Uh, North Korea, another area, right? And Trump met with Kim Jong two, three times actually, but he really did not talk to North Korea. He did not really address North Korea's concerns. I think he's more interested in photo opportunities with Kim Jong Un. And I don't think the United States can unilaterally solve the North Korean problem. And you need China's cooperation. Yeah. So in other words, you know, uh, again, just predicting. Uh, <laughs> Assuming I know what's going to happen in the future, right? I think you know uh, it, there's a good reason to believe that uh, the relationship between China and the United States under President Biden will be more stable, more predictable, not necessarily uh, more friendly towards each other, right? But I think they'll treat each other with more respect and uh, with more mutual understanding what their policies are, uh, and you will see perhaps less confrontation. There will still be confrontation on issues like human rights. In Taiwan, right? I think there will be less confrontation and uh, and more cooperation, especially on climate change in North Korea. I stop there. There's another question: like, have Chinese foreign policy towards ASEAN changed during Xi Jinping's era? How and why? Uh, ASEAN, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, most recently, uh, uh, China and uh, for other countries, South, um, uh, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, joined ASEAN countries, and they, you know, they signed this uh, uh, ASEP, right? Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. This is the largest uh, free trade uh, agreement. Um, I mean, that's an example of how uh, China's relations with uh, with its neighbors, with uh, ASEAN countries, has become. I mean, within ASEAN countries, of course, uh, it's complicated. Uh, 10 countries, well, plus East Timor, you have 11 countries over there in Southeast Asia. Uh, some countries are probably more pro-West, pro the United States. Others are firmly uh, supportive of China, right? Cambodia, Laos, for example, definitely more supportive of China. Uh, so I think I don't think China is interested in, in dividing uh, ASEAN into, I think China is definitely focused on more cooperation, mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, 
uh, build, uh, building upon uh, decades of solidarity with uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, and expand trade investment, uh, also promote cultural education exchanges. I think those are the areas that uh, China will do in, in, you know, towards Southeast Asia. And I, I, on the other hand, I don't think Southeast Asian countries uh, want to be uh, forced to choose sides between China and United States. So here's an advice for the US government, you know, don't force other countries, especially Southeast Asian countries to choose sides, right? Because these countries don't want to choose sides. They, I mean, ideally they want to maintain good relations with both the United States and China. Right? And they okay. want they want the United States to be to be to be in Asia to provide this security guarantee, but they definitely want to cooperate with China in terms of the economy and trade. Uh, so the other question, how does China view quadrilateral and Indo-Pacific strategy? How does the rise of quadrilateral alliance affect China's rise? Quad, right? You talk about quad. Uh, India and quad, okay. I think, you know, uh, that's for India to, uh, to decide, you know, uh, whether India wants to become part of the quad or some people even talk about the, maybe India become the the, the sixth eye, you know, in the so-called five eyes group of the West in, in terms of sharing intelligence. I always argue that um, India and China have more common interests than India does with, with the West. Why? Because India and China both are developing countries and their priority is domestic development, which is very different from <laughs> Western developing countries, you know. How will court affect uh, uh, China's rise? I don't, I don't think uh, it will affect that much. Why? Because the court is a very loosely formed uh, group. I don't think uh, India is already, you know, has already made up its mind. I think India is still kind of hesitating, you know, whether it should join the United States to, to become part of the counter China group. Uh, that, that, that's, that's, uh, be frank here, you know. Um, I think this core, this idea is, a, is a outdated, you know. It's a Cold War style ideological division of countries into different camps. You know? So this core, ostensibly, you know, is a group of democracies, right? And China is not democracy, and China is rising. So, group of democracies should uh, team up against China. Now, this is a very typical Cold War style uh, way of thinking, and I don't think it's going to work. And um, I don't think China is bothered by, by, uh, by the Quad. And, it, and uh, I don't think you know, other countries will uh, join the Quad to be part of the anti-China camp. And I don't think this uh, Cold, Cold War style division of countries into different camps still works today. Uh, let me move to the next question. Is China's foreign policy under Xi Jinping a threat to regional peace and stability? Can you say it again? Is China's foreign policy under Xi Jinping a threat to regional peace and security? Uh, is the policy uh, contributing to peace and st stability? Threat. Is it a threat to regional peace and security? Trade. Threat, like it's a fear. Like oh, threat, a okay, threat. Um, it depends on who, uh, who is answering that question, I guess, right? I mean, um, if you ask the outgoing U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, he will say yes, <laughs> right? Definitely, China's foreign uh, policy is a threat to regional peace, even global peace and stability, right? Uh, if you ask, you know, some countries in Africa, maybe, or Southeast Asia, you know, uh, more likely uh, the answer would be uh, more nuanced. Uh, I think you know, uh, it, if you are objective. Probably you are not going to say it's a threat to global peace and stability. I mean, 
for, for those who think that uh, China is a threat, well, we can ask them, you know, what are the specific examples that China has become a threat, right? I mean, you, you can talk about South China Sea. I'm, I'm sure people will say, oh, South, how about South China Sea? How about India-China border, right? I know that, you know, I mean, if you, if you like, you know, I can elaborate, you know, but I, I just want to point out that I'm, I'm not <laughs> unaware of, of, of those issues, right? Uh, but I think it's, you'll be hard pressed to argue that uh, China is a, is a force that threatens peace and development. I think the other, uh, I think the, uh, the, the opposite argument can be made here, actually. I think China has contributed to peace and development in the world. As I mentioned earlier, you know, just lifting 800 million people out of poverty, that's the greatest contribution to global efforts to, to eradicate poverty. That's the greatest achievement in human rights. That's the greatest achievement to global peace and prosperity. I mean, how can you use some uh, occasional, you know, clashes on the border issues and territorial issues to claim that, uh, you know, China is a threat to global peace? That doesn't make sense. Again, I know some people may disagree with me here, you know, I fully respect uh, your perspective, but uh, since you asked me this question, I'll have to answer that question. And I, the short answer is no, I don't think China is a threat to regional peace and development. Uh Professor, what is your view on China's policy on Uyghur Muslims and human rights violation in education and vocational training center in Xinjiang? Yeah. It's a very controversial issue. You know, I have to admit that I've never been to Xinjiang and I don't know the uh, exact situation, <laughs> what's happening over there, right? There are two different versions. The uh, Chinese version, official version is that uh, uh, these are educational facilities uh, to uh, uh, provide training for these uh, people so that they can be weaned from uh, any uh, you know, terrorist uh, way of thinking. So this is done to promote stability to as part of a campaign against terrorism, right? That's the Chinese official version, right? <laughs> Western version, apparently based on uh, uh, based on this particular scholar, I forgot his name, you know, uh, he uh, uh, and some uh, journalists apparently uh, visited uh, those facilities and uh, their conclusion is that uh, these are concentration detention uh, camps. People uh, inside those camps have no freedom and they were forced labor uh, inside the facilities. Uh, they were forced to uh, receive uh, vaccination. They were forced to uh, work um, inside the factories over there. So I, I, again, I don't know the exact, where's the truth, right? Uh, where's the fact? Uh, but, but beside that, I think in obviously uh, uh, China needs to do more, to, uh, to, needs to do a better job in, uh, in those ethnic areas, not just uh, Xinjiang, but also Tibet, uh, in the Mongolia, right? And other ethnic, uh, ethnic regions. I think it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental challenge uh, for uh, Chinese leadership. You know? That is how to uh, promote ethnic harmony, how to promote uh, minority and Han relationship. And um, can you promote economic growth uh, while maintaining the ethnic, cultural, tradition, religion, those kind of things at the same time. You know. In that area, I, I believe that China definitely can, can and should do more, right? But on the particular case of Xinjiang, you know, I, again, I don't know the reality. Uh, I'm aware of the two uh, very vastly different and opposite, almost opposite interpretations of what is happening over there. Uh, and of course, most people outside China follow this Western narrative, right? and consider those uh, camps as uh, concentration camps. Uh, with, um, uh, I mean, some people in the US Congress even um, are proposing passing a bill to condemn China uh, for genocide in Xinjiang. Uh, I mean, that's a, a very serious uh, crime, right? But uh, do they have specific 
Do they have solid evidence showing that? I'm not aware of that, right? Uh, so I will leave it there. You know, again, you know, I'm not familiar with the reality, the real situation in Xinjiang. Uh, I, I think uh, both sides seem to be uh, adamant in presenting their argument. But my overall assessment is that China definitely needs to do more to uh, improve its ethnic policies, to promote ethnic and high relationship. That's my overall observation. Thank you. Uh, what is the future of BRI in the post COVID-19 world? Is it going to continue or it's going to be halted? Um, I think you know the uh, impact of COVID uh, will be uh, long term, right? We don't know what's going to happen in, in immediate next few years. Um, I think most likely in the following couple of years, uh, China probably will uh, scale down its investment. Uh, China needs to focus on its own domestic growth. Uh, I don't think it, uh, it will be able to. Uh, cast a wide net you know, uh, investment in, uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, I think that you will see some uh, scale down in terms of uh, volume of investment uh, and trade right, along the Belt and Road. But I think uh, in, in the long term, you know, uh, this uh, project will continue. There's no indication that uh, China is going to scrap uh, this uh, initiative, even, even after Xi Jinping, I think, you know, this belt road, or you, you rename it perhaps in the future. You know, it, it's going to continue. Why? Because it's uh, you know it, it's it's almost a necessity. You know, uh, based on China's growing power, pro growing economy. No, your national interests will follow your investment and 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 trade. And as a largest economy, very soon largest economy, still second largest, right? China's interests have expanded uh, and, and so, uh, so has its uh, trade and investment, right? So that's just a natural development. Uh, there's no way uh, to stop it. Although the pandemic may slow down the process to some extent, I still think that uh, uh, BRI will continue. And, and look at the you know, latest statistic, I think, you know, when the BRI was first unveiled in 2013, many people, even people inside China, were not clear about what, what, what this initiative is about, right? Um, so some uh, seven, eight years later, you know, uh, I look at the latest uh, statistic, you know, so over uh, uh, three, actually 130, 138 countries and over 30 international organizations have either endorsed BI or have been part of it. So it has become a global project. It's not just the Chinese, you know, um, many people will, you know, looking at the BI tend to think that this is Chinese uh, initiative. This is Xi Jinping's policy, right? Uh, wrong, you know, it has become a global uh, effort. I mean, these countries are joining the BI, not forced by China, you know, uh, they're, uh, they're trying to, uh, benefit from uh, China's growth and it has become part of this, you know, so this has become a global project. So um, I think the project looks promising in the, in the long term. Uh, let's move to the next question. How do you look at RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership? Is it a geopolitical win for China? <laughs> well, I mentioned uh, ICEP earlier, you know, uh, I, I'm reluctant to uh, uh, label a particular uh, free trade agreement as a win or, or, or a loss for somebody. Uh, although it's viewed by uh, many people, especially in the West in the United States, as a win for China. I, I reject that kind of a simplistic uh, perspective. I think, you know, um, RCEP uh, is an in inclusive and open uh, trading bloc. Countries that are outside of it still have a chance to become part of it. Uh, for example, India, you know, uh, I mean, this audience probably know uh, better than me, you know, 
in the uh, under President Mo uh, Prime Minister Modi, you know, uh, was struggling to figure out, you know, whether it should be part of it. Uh, then uh, there's uh, opposition, and there, you know, because China is playing a leadership role, and India doesn't feel comfortable <laughs> working with China in this group. So essentially, eventually, you know, India decided not to be part of it. Then uh, uh, many uh, many scholars have pointed out that uh, India made a strategic mistake by not being part of it because India uh, is going to lose. Uh, India will not be able to join this group as part of the global uh, value chain, right? And India will be less likely to uh, get foreign investment uh, from uh, that group. So I'm not sure how, how to answer that <laughs> question, but I think, you know, again, I don't, I, I reject this, this uh, view of uh, ASEP as a win for somebody or lose for somebody else. Uh, I think, you know, it's a global trend. You know, if you want to uh, benefit from globalization, you want to join the multilateral groups. You want to be part of the multilateral free trade groups. This is true for China, this is true for the United States, this is true for India as well. Uh, so, uh, so right now, of course, you know, China seems to be uh, uh, taking that uh, uh, approach and some other countries are not taking that approach. I mean, it's, it's their decision, it's their choice. Uh, I don't think it's a win for China necessarily. I think it's, it's just China's choice. I think China, is, uh, uh, China believes that uh, being part of the ASEP will benefit uh, its uh, economy, will benefit uh, its uh, environment for foreign investment, uh, and it made that decision, you know. As for other countries, you know, it's, it's their choice. You know, if they think uh, they can win, they can join. If they think that they're going to lose, then they stay outside of it. It's their choice. So there's another interesting question. Like if China is worrying about her sovereignty in case of Hong Kong and Taiwan, why is it not respecting other countries' sovereignty? For example, India, Bhutan, Mongolia, Vietnam, and others. Okay, so can you, uh, well, well, this is the uh, drawback of uh, not being able to talk to people face to face, you know. So when you say China does not uh, respect other countries' sovereignty, uh, what are the examples of China not respecting India's sovereignty? Can, can, uh, can the person who raised the question give me an example? Uh, China I, not- probably, uh, They're talking sovereignty. about border disputes. Uh, that yeah, like, okay. Okay, I, I'm, I'm sure, yeah, I know, I know, I know uh, you're talking, uh, you know, the questions about the border uh, dispute. And uh, that's, a, that's one of the favorite questions from my Indian friends, right? They, when they talk about China-India relations, they always focus on the border. Uh, well, I, no, I mean, we can spend another hour, you know, talking about the Indian and China relations, right? But very briefly, you know, I, I, I think it's pointless to blame each other for the border uh, clash. Because for every uh, accusation from the Indian side, the Chinese side can also present a counter argument and vice versa. For each accusation from China against India, Indian side can come up with a counter argument. That, it, it's, it's not an issue of sovereignty because when you think, you, if you think that, oh, that part of, his, uh, part, part of territory is, is Indian's sovereignty, I mean, the Chinese will say, no, 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 that's part of Chinese sovereignty, right? So this is not an issue of sovereignty here, I would argue, right? This is, long story short, you know, I think, you know, this is about balance of power. This is about uh, India losing the equilibrium. This is also a typical security dilemma in international politics. You know, those of you who are familiar with international politics, this concept of security dilemma perfectly explains what is happening in the Indian-China border. You know, if you ask me who is, who is to blame, I think both sides are to blame because both sides have done something to contribute to the rising tensions along the border. Because why? Because both sides have done something to change the status quo along the border. India for, side, for example, has built new roads, right? And, and uh, new facilities along the border and Chinese side also have beefed up its presence in the region. So the status quo has been changed by both sides. And the security dilemma is that 
when the two powers don't trust each other, you know, whenever somebody, whenever A does something to, uh, uh, to, to strengthen its position, it, it will be viewed by B as a threat. So whenever India does something, China will view it as a challenge to the status quo, as a direct threat to China's security, and vice versa. Whenever China does something along the Chinese side of the border, Indian side will view it as a direct threat to Indian security. So this is a typical example of, uh, of the so-called security dilemma in international affairs. Now, how to overcome this? As I mentioned earlier, you know, I think India and China need to step out of this border dispute. Look at the big picture. What is big picture? The big picture is India and China, both with 1.4 billion people, are two largest developing nations, which share many common interests. The biggest common interest, the biggest common denominator, common denominator is growth, development. And don't get distracted by that. And don't be, uh, 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 you know, mis, uh, misled by some external powers. And I think, you know, if you go back to a long history of India and China relations, of course, the two proud nations have learned from each other, have benefited from uh, learning from each other. I mean, there's no reason why they cannot you know, continue to develop this friendly relationship, mutually beneficial relationship, instead of instead of focusing on the border issue. So again, once again, I want to my, my especially my friends from India, you know, don't just, you know, think that the India-China relations uh, is about the border. The border is just a very small part of it. And if you look at the big picture, uh, it's more complicated. And I think, I, I think the Indian and Chinese leaders and Indian Chinese people have the wisdom uh, to, explore ways to move forward and to uh, to recognize that uh, they do have differences but they they can cooperate on many many other issues so so listen to me you know forget about the border dispute there's no there's no solution in short term thank you sir so how do you look at china japan relation unfolding in days to come uh, China Japan in what? Uh, how do we look at China Japan relations in coming days? Coming days, okay. China Japan. Uh, now, I, now I, I'm an international relations scholar. You know, I follow this power transition theory. I think a lot of things uh, that that are happening in international relations can be viewed from this power transition perspective. Uh, that applies to U.S. China relations, but also applies to US, uh, China, Japan relations. If you look at the global situation, you know, you can see that uh, the power transition perhaps is taking place from, uh, from the United States to China, right? But in the regional situation, you know, regional setting, uh, you can argue that the power transition is taking place or maybe has already taken place, you know, from, from Japan to China. Now, Japan from the mid 1960s, had been the second largest economy in the world, the largest in the world from mid 1960 to uh, 2010, for over four decades. Japan was number one, right? I mean, you, you're familiar with uh, Harvard professor Ezra Vogel, who recently passed away, right? Wrote a book uh, back in 1970, 1980, you know, Japan's number one. So Japan is a proud nation. Japan was the largest economy. In Asia, uh, then suddenly uh, uh, China uh, overtook that position, right? In 2010, China became uh, the largest economy overtaking Japan. So this uh, power transition uh, has really cast a long shadow on the relationship between Japan and China since 2010. Because the power transition uh, is not complete because, uh, I mean, Japan's economy is smaller than China, but Japan is still way advanced than China in many aspects, right? In technology, uh, in management, and just in governance, I think China has a lot to learn from Japan. But, but the power structure has changed. So 
both Japan and China will have to adjust to the changing power structure. And uh, I, I think China should overcome its uh, uh, impulse to look down upon Japan. I think China should not look down upon Japan. Japan is still very powerful, very competitive, very innovative, right? On the other hand, Japan should not feel uh, uh, disappointed or uh, feel slighted uh, simply because China is, has a big economy now. I think Japan should have more confidence in its uh, staying power. Now, uh, probably you're, you're referring to uh, the uh, uh, historical uh, issue, historical disputes uh, between Japan and China. Again, just like India and China dispute, you know, I feel like these historical disputes are most difficult to <laughs> resolve. And I, I feel like, you know, uh, instead of trying to find a solution to these historical disputes, I think all these countries need to really move forward, you know, just leave those uh, uh, issues uh, to the next generation. I mean, we talked about Deng Xiaoping earlier. I think Deng Xiaoping has a very famous saying actually in dealing with Japan. I think he told Japanese leaders back in the 1980s and 1970s when, when Japan was normalized relations with China. Deng Xiaoping said, look, you know, we have this dispute, right? Senkaku, Diaoyu Islands, you know, historic issues, uh, comfort women, there are a lot of disputes, history textbooks, you know. We, you know, we just, you know, we, we should focus on normalizing relations and focusing on areas we can cooperate. Let's leave the problems to the ne next generation. The next generation will have more wisdom <laughs> than us. So I, I think that that's a good advice actually for current leaders of Japan and China and, and really for people, current population in Japan, China or India, you know. Maybe our children or grandchildren will have more wisdom or by then, you know, all these problems will not be problems at all. So I'm more optimistic and I think, you know, we definitely need to focus on areas they can cooperate instead of uh, you know, focusing on all these negative uh, disputed areas. That's my comment on Japan-China relations, very similar to China-India relations. Uh, thank you, sir. We still have lots of questions, lots of questions on China-Russia relations and uh, relation with China and India. And there are many questions yet to come, but we're running out of time. So let me put the last question for today. U.S. is talking of decoupling of its economy with China. Is it possible at a time when U.S. economy is struggling in post-COVID-19 world? Well, the, the the person who raised the question already answered the question, you know, right? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the question itself says it's impossible, right? I mean, uh, uh, China is the uh, only economy, only major economy that actually has uh, grown in 2020. I think the latest uh, figure shows that the Chinese economy grew by 2.5, 2.4%, right? And all these other economies, in including US economy, actually have declined. And, and you still try to decouple with China, it doesn't make sense. Uh, so I think the uh, question already answered, uh, you know, uh, uh, the question already provided answer <laughs> to the question itself. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense, but also it's it's not feasible in this globalized world. Uh, you look at the, the dynamic trade going on, you know, between the two sides. You look at uh, the uh, extensive exchanges uh, between the two sides, although disrupted by the pandemic, right? The, the exchanges are so extensive, so dynamic. There's no way you can you can easily decouple these two major powers, economically, socially, culturally. That 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 runs counter to the reality and to the to the trend. So uh, I appreciate that question, and I think uh, you already answered that question. You know. Uh a lot of more questions maybe we should do another session you know just to address so maybe this, we can have one more session. discussion of all those questions uh thank you professor Chishun too thank you so much for your interesting discussion we really want to thank you for your responses i on behalf of nice and all the participants want to thank you for your time we hope to ha have you again in future maybe in real in Kathmandu. i would like to thank you all the participants for the interesting questions professor too have a nice day and good night to all our participants from south asia thank you so much good night